progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we look to open the word today, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we may more properly understand what we are about to read and its relation for our time and that which we need to understand. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to join together on this Sabbath day. We thank you, Father, for these blessings that you have provided, your word, and your word for our time. We thank you for the words of your prophet. We thank you for the words of all of the prophets that have gone before. Help us now to understand that which we need to understand as we look through these examples of the past so that we may see more clearly that which we need to know for this time that is just before us. Be with us each one. Thank you, Father, for those that are joining in this meeting today. Thank you for those that will view this later. We ask now for your blessing and your direction. May your angels guide us and direct us for this. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So. As we were studying in the book of Zephaniah, it came to a point where we had some references here from 1 Kings chapter 11. And we're going to do just a brief overview, and then we're going to get into specific portions of this. Now, as we are seeing, Solomon's multitude of wives and concubines, who in his old age seduce him to idolatry. Solomon did not walk before God all the days of his life, as did his father, David. We were able to place that Solomon went onto the throne at the age of 18. If he then reigned for 40 years, it means that for our estimation of a lifespan, that Solomon died at the relatively young age of 58. Now, by verse 9, God threatens to rend or tear the greater part of the kingdom from Solomon's family. We have some points that we, had, we touched on briefly. We have not gotten very deeply into this. Solomon finds an adversary in Hadad the Edomite, who had been entertained in Egypt, and in Rezin, who reigned in Damascus, and in Jeroboam, whom Ahijah had prophesied the kingdom would be translated. So, in this portion, does Solomon face a confederacy of three? a threefold union. Are these creating problems for him? And what would we say is the interrelation for our time today? Well, it definitely seems like what we have is our time. And, but there are some, some things because we have this civil war that's going to be happening. Right. Right. So, and that's going to happen with Solomon's death. Right. <clears throat> but prior to that, we hear that Jeroboam is going to receive 10 tribes. And now we got reason. Um, so that's kind of interesting here. You have the same name that you have. Uh, so I don't know what that means, but. Is we've seen that name. I wonder if it's if that's some. Anyway, I'm just thinking out loud. Sure. Dealing with that uh, name reason. Who okay. He is. 
never looked that up before. Well, we will we'll go into this here in just a yeah. moment. Yeah. So <clears throat> as the first verse had stated, but King Solomon loved many strange women besides the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. So Solomon entered into covenantal relationships with those that God said he should not. If there is one thing more than anything else that shows Solomon turning his back on God, it is this, that he would enter into covenant with the people that he was told not to enter covenant with. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Now, I found this interesting that in Ecclesiasticus chapter 47, verse 19, it states, Thou didst bow thy loins unto women, and by thy body thou wast brought into subjection. The situation here is that Solomon made a choice and it was a choice contrary to the very word of God. I mean, I, <clears throat> there's a symbolic relationship here of having 700 wives and then with seeing 300 concubines on top of that. I mean, how much time could he spend with each one? Almost nothing. Well, many of the wives were just political alliances. So, right. But still, when you're married, you do look to spend time with your wife. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, he, he really didn't spend much time with any one of them in particular, I don't think. Yeah. So, <clears throat> for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians and after Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. And here from 1 Kings 11, verse 7, which jumps a couple. Then did Solomon build a high place, place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And the question was asked when we last were covering this, mm -hmm. could this have been giving reference to the Mount of Olives? That Solomon could have had idols where Christ would later pray. Now, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and fulfilled not after the Lord, as did David his father. And we're given a, com a, a comparison here. Was Solomon's spirit the equivalent of Caleb's? I would have to say no. Because in Numbers 14, 24, we're finding, but my servant Caleb, because he hath another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land where into he went, and his seed shall possess it. The promise is given to Caleb that because he followed the land fully, his seed would possess the land. Now we're looking at Solomon. He did not follow the land. He did not follow God fully, and the land was being taken from his seed. 
So we're having to compare the two. The choice that we have is whether or not we're going to follow the Lord. Now, is this a working definition, a working example of the third angel's message? I mean, is that a difficult question? No. I'm just waiting for somebody else to answer it. <laughs> well, I guess I guess my uh, cold shower that I gave everyone last Sabbath is uh, is still bothering some. Okay. okay. <clears throat> it bother, it bothered me. <laughs> well, not bothering me. <laughs> I'm sorry that it bothered you, but I mean, I, I said it's not bothering me. <laughs> okay, good. So in this in this situation with this comparison between Solomon and Caleb, is this giving us a working example of the third angel's message? What's your thoughts? Still thinking. Okay. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in that hill before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Like, and likewise he did for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. So when Solomon entered into this covenant relationship, He turned his back. He gave acceptance by the mind and by the hand because he built for them high places. He built for them altars. He allowed them to, build, to burn their incense and to make sacrifices to their gods. Here is an example of receiving the seal in the forehead and receiving the seal in the hand. Now from the, from the chat, that incense for the strange wives, syncretism or ecumenism, I understand the, the second word. I don't understand the first. That's, that's simply the mixing of different religious uh, practices. Ah. That would be the strange wives. Uh, well, strange, it, doc, strange doctrine. Would that be correct? Strange doctrine? It might yes. be. Might be. I don't know. Okay, yes, now it is. It's a mix of abominations. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared unto him twice. Now, in the message, the third message in Revelation 14, those that choose the mark of the beast that have either assented mentally to what's being presented or they have decided that they are going to support it by their actions, are they walking in God's path? No. So Solomon is an example of those that would bear the mark of the beast. And it commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not which the Lord commanded. 
And then in the verse, 1 Kings 11, 11, chapter and verse, a doubling. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. You've made your choice. This is what's going to happen. Was Solomon here being given the opportunity to repent? He could have at any time up to this point, right? I would assume so. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but that I will rend out of thy hand of, the, of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all of the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So it's intriguing to me of the tribes that were existing at that time. One tribe belonged to God. That was the Levites. We understand that. With this verse, the question becomes, what was the tribe for David and what was the tribe for Jerusalem? And are they two separate tribes? Okay, well, <clears throat> now I think what, so we got, um, so when it says one tribe, he already has Judah. Okay. So, so I think it's referring to, to another tribe, which would be uh, Simeon, I guess. So 10 are going to go to the north, and he's going to have one tribe added to Judah. So that would be the two tribes. Because when I was reading it before, I just thought, well, that's referring to Judah. But he already has one tribe. Right. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yes. Yeah. I mean, Simeon, the Simeon was in the borders of Judah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. Now, when they say that Hadad was of the king's seed in Edom, what relationship is he then to Solomon? Wasn't he a scribe to the king? What kind of scribe? Mm, I don't think so. I'm seeing if Hadad was an Edomite, that Hadad was a descendant of Esau. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so if Hadad was a descendant of Esau, then he would have been a cousins of Solomon somewhat removed. Now, for it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab, the captain of the host, had gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. Now, I was using some other sources to look up some names. Hey, Dad. It may mean clamor. We have Tophanes, the queen of Egypt, 
and it's her sister that is given to Hadad as a wife. But Tophanes may mean temptation or flight. The sister of Tophanes, who is not identified, bears a son to Hadad. Genubath, a Genubath, means theft or robbery. <clears throat> so we have Hadad of Edom, clamor or noise, married to the sister of temptation, and they produce theft or robbery. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So we're told in 1118, and they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave Hadad an house and appointed him victuals or food and gave him land. House, food, land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tophanes, the queen, the sister of temptation. And the sister of temptation bare him theft, robbery, his son, whom the sister of temptation weaned in Pharaoh's house. And this boy was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to, to Pharaoh, send me away that I may go to my own country. And Pharaoh said unto him, But what have you lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered nothing, albeit let me go anyways. I have not wanted for anything. Everything has been provided for me. You have provided, <clears throat> we have all of these things that we have seen so far, but I wish to return to my own country. And God stirred up another adversary, Rezin, the son of Eliada, which fled from his lord, Hadrazer, the king of Zobah. Now, if, if what I've looked up is correct, resin here could be lean, small, secret, or a prince. Eliada is God is knowing. Hadrazer, beauty of assistance, and the name of Zoba is a station. <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, so if, if you look at the word Ezer there, that's like an Ebenezer, a stone of help, right? right. And hey, dad is just hey, dad, Ezer. Right, so you just got those, those two parts put together. Right. So. And he, Resin, gathered men unto him and became a captain over a band when David slew them of Zobah and they went to Damascus and dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon beside the mischief that Hadad did and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, 
an Ephrathite of Zerita, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zerua, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. Now, what do we see that is interesting about this statement in 1126? First, Jeroboam was of the tribe of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. When we were looking at this this last week, who else was identified as being a prince of Ephraim? Was it not Joshua? I took pain medicine yesterday. Why? Okay. Now. Yeah. yeah, so we have here, of course, so Nebat is the father of Jeroboam. Right. I assume that's there. And he's from the city of Zerida. Okay. Which is, uh, did we look at those cities? Did you guys look at that city? At no, all? we did not. We did not. I was just wondering. Uh, it's also Zerida is really how it's pronounced. Okay. Zeradatha. Um, but here it's just Zerida. So. Okay. But if we were to look up the name of his mother, Jeroboam was of the line of Nebat, but his mother's name was Zerua. Yeah, Zerua. And does her name not mean leprous? Yeah. So this is the son of leprosy. This is the son of a curse. And he did become a curse to the house of Solomon. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. So he built a rampart. And he repaired the breaches of the city of David. And for this, Jeroboam was upset with Solomon. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he did work, he made him ruler over all of the burden of the house of Joseph. So was Jeroboam then placed over both Ephraim and Manasseh? If it says here that he was put in charge over the house of Joseph? Um, well, usually it just Joseph refers to just Ephraim. Okay. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite. So this is Ahijah from Shiloh. Ahijah from the city where the tribes first gathered. Found him in the way and he had clad himself with a new garment and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take thee three piece, take thee 10 pieces. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to thee, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake. And for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel.
because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, Malcolm, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Was Solomon leading the nation into apostasy? Was this apostasy occurring from the top on down? Mm -hmm. Yep. So how do we apply this for ourselves today? Well, it usually starts with leaders, you know. Exactly. Howbeit, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands, and I will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. Now, we are told to see for Samuel 15, 27, and 28. As Samuel turned to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, Samuel said unto Saul, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than you. Here we are seeing that this rending of the garment is a separation. How could we apply rending of the garment with what has been going on in the movement and the church over the last several years? A running of the garment which Christ put on and we rent it off. Um, a strange, strange doctrine or wise. Okay. Any other thought? So garment we've decided that it has to do with character right um, and now this god has exposed saul's character at that point and did he not um at at the time of solomon expose his character as well yes he did and so what how can we relate that uh the character, the clothing, and the king. Well, did Jeff not try to apply his, quote, mantle to Parminder? I'm sorry, again, please. Did Jeff not attempt to apply the mantle of leadership to Parminder? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Now, at that point, that mantle of leadership should not have been passed to Parminder. So was it not torn from Parminder? Um, yes. And, and can we relate um, the act of Jeff giving the mantle over 
um, to why he his his uh, his aunt, or the future for future for America basically ended at that point. Can we relate that? I think that's one of the questions that we're trying to to look at right now. I'm sorry about the grumbling behind me. It's my bird. Oh. <laughs> the bird has something to say. <laughs> so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Comment from the chat is that we're being suggested to take a look at Joel 2, verse 13. Can somebody please read that? Joel what? Joel 2, verses thir verse 13. I have it. And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Okay. With a warning from God, you always have an invitation for repentance and come to repent. Right. So Solomon had the invitation for repentance and chose not to accept it. There's going to be a time where we will be giving a message, the third message of Revelation 14, which will be a time for repentance for those that wish to follow God in spirit and in truth. That time of repentance is not going to be a long time. No, you know, um, I thought um, when you were reading about Solomon and his wives and, and those that took over the kingdom of God was going to rend it from them. Right. From him, um, it seemed almost uh, fitting to uh, compare it with the SDA church and the questions on doctrine and, and all the issues around that. I agree. I mean, not, not only did this happen in 1957, but we have the, the conference session in 1980, where the people decided that they were no longer going to let leadership tell them what to believe that they wished to make up the points of doctrine that they felt were most necessary. In the last 42 years, we have seen so many things that have occurred within the church that to me would be considered strange. We are seeing that the church with a health message is a large provider of abortion. We are seeing that a church with a health message is choosing to ignore portions of the message that Mrs. White had presented, especially with what foods are fit for human consumption. We have a church that is deciding that the doctrines of the other churches are more to be accepted than the plain teaching of the Bible. You see, that, you see that in some of the, uh, in the quarterlies, we can see that. Agreed. How can a message like a trumpet go out from a confused people? 
It wouldn't be a trumpet. Right. Be some other kind of instrument. <laughs> be confusion too, right? Exactly. How can you have a light shining that is being hidden? Can, can we have a message such as what Mrs. White has given to the world, has given freely to the world? Can we have such a message when that message is being hidden by the administration of the church? Can it be shown to the people? The church is incapable of doing it, is the point that I'm trying to get at. Because when we read this verse, and unto his son will I give one tribe that David, my servant, may have a candle, a lamp, always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. <clears throat> and I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shall be king over Israel. And it shall be, if thou will hearken unto me, if the, excuse me, and it shall be, if thou will hearken unto all that I command thee, and thou wilt walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and will build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Israel is being offered to a son of Joseph. Comment from the chat. Solomon represents a seat a series of apostate general conference heads and others who have set policy. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, the king of Egypt and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. We don't have an understanding of the time of how long Solomon had been reigning and how much time was remaining of his reign. But we know that Jeroboam fled to Egypt. He went back down to the same area where Hadad found safety. He went to an idolatrous nation to find safety. Are we to turn to those that do not honor God? Is this to be where we find safety? No. How would Caleb have done something like this? Would he not have stood up? Would he not have faced the danger in front of him to defeat the idolatrous practices so that he could secure the land for himself and for his children? Is this not what we are to do? And the rest of the acts of Solomon, or the words, or the things of Solomon, and all that he did, and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon?
And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, dying young like that at 58, you know, he lived a hard life. Had to be a very hard life. Yeah. Sin, is, sin is a hard, you know, hard on the body and spirit and everything. Now, what else are we seeing in this? What else can we address from this example here from the Book of Kings? Well, that's personally. Okay. The personal work. There's a lot that we can see here regarding what has been going on with the church and regarding what has to go on within our own lives. We cannot give a third angel's message unless we understand the first two. Solomon turned from the first angel's message to fear God. In his youth, he feared God. In his youth, he gave glory to him. But older, as he became more comfortable in the gifts that God had given him, he chose to turn his back upon that third message that recognizes that the hour of God's judgment has come. Solomon then chose to accept the mark of the beast. Solomon chose to walk contrary to God in thought and in action. This is the challenge that's being laid before us today. But this is the example that was presented with Solomon for us to consider. Now, yeah, this guy was the wisest guy in the world, right? Exactly. He was the one that God had blessed and had blessed with more light than any other individual. Here is the church, the apple of God's eye. Here is a church that has had more light than any other church <clears throat> at any other time, and yet is turned away from that light. Decided to, to go, decided to, uh, go with the strange wives. I was going to say, according to a fire of their own kindling. Okay, yeah. And I agree, I agree with your point. We cannot afford to go after the doctrines of others. We cannot afford to go after a method of study of the others. We need to decide for ourselves what we are going to do. Any questions? Well, to study in the poor fashion, for one thing. Sound like your bird had something else to say. Okay, so I'm very sorry. No, no, you're fine. I have, I have him. And come here. Come here. Come here. And him that I'm dealing with. Okay. <laughs> he, and he is the most vocal dog I've ever had. Really? <laughs> yeah. Everybody's you hear him? Everything is. 
he talks he talks to us he he, he says things to us and we pretty much understand him now <laughs> very nice very nice okay so do we have anything else that we that we should be looking at within this chapter any other consideration that we should be going through we may have missed something okay <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't know. <laughs> I mean, we're picking up so much. It's, uh, it's hard to say if we've got everything or not. Okay. Well, I'm going to throw a couple of things out from, from some of the conversations that have come up since last Sabbath's. Uh, conversation and presentation. Some of us were there for Stephen's presentation on tabled history. There were some comments that we went over that um, I've had to look at and I've had to, to really shake my head at, but there are some things we need to consider at this point. So I am going to share Okay, now, Stephen sent out this week some charts that were, that were kind of interesting to be considered. As we are, as many of us are already aware that when Methuselah was born, he lived 187 years before the birth of Lamech, his son. And that Lamech lived for 777 years and roughly five years before the death of his father, Methuselah, Lamech died. Of all of the patriarchs at that time, his, the record of his life looks to be one of the shortest. Now, we have 457 years from the death of Lamech to the birth of Isaac. And 457 is an important number for us because in 457 BC, that third decree was issued. But it, it was intriguing to me that from the death of Lamech, if we go 1,938 years or 969 times two, we can be brought to a point of 457 BC. Isaac was born 1938 BC. From 457 BC, if we go 777 years, we come to the period of the Sunday law of Constantine. 187 years after that, we come to 508, where pagan Rome is being removed from the throne of the world. And pagan Rome is then giving way to papal Rome. Now, during our conversation last week, there was an opportunity to look up some points in history. One of those points that we addressed had to deal with the Edict of Expulsion on the 18th of July of the year 1290. 
So the edict of expulsion occurred on July 18th, 1290, and 1290 is a symbol that is addressed in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. What Stephen calculated <clears throat> based upon this edict is that the Jews were given 2,500, 2,520 hours to leave England on the 18th of July of 1290. Could you move the chart over a little bit? You could do that. Just a second. That is a Thanks. Sure. So here we have this 969 years. From the Sunday Law of Constantine, 969 years later, we have this edict of expulsion. From the edict of expulsion, we go 508 years and we come down to 1798. The classic understanding within Adventism has been that the 1290 years, beginning in 508, ended in 1798. We have this 1290 date that is in recorded history. We are not time setting at this. We are looking at what has already gone on in the past. However, brothers and sisters, I want you to consider something else. In this chart, Stephen has correctly placed the Sunday Law of Constantine in 321 AD. Also correctly placed is the publication of the King James Bible in 1611. Consider for a moment that from the time of the Sunday Law of Constantine to the time when great light was being presented to the world in the King James Bible is also a period of 1,290 years. Amazing. We yeah, now have that represented on a chart by chance. It will be. We'll be putting yeah. this together. Thank you. But in this situation, consider this. We now have three witnesses to 1,290. We have three witnesses that are for a time period that many within the church would like not to have to address. Now, as we come through this step by step, from, the Sunday, from 34 AD to the Sunday Law took place a period of 287 years. We have a symbol of July 18th that goes from that Sunday Law to the time where pagan Rome is removed from the throne. 287, 782, the same numbers in a different order. 782 years take us from 508 to 1290. All the way through, when we come down here to the King James Bible being released in 1611, 187 years later, 1798, the Pope is taken captive by General Berthier. How many more symbols can we find of 187? of July 18th that are relevant within this movement. 
These are symbols of history. This is not manufactured. Can't be, it can't be manufactured. Possible. It's in, totally impossible. Consider as well. From 34 AD to 64 AD, a period of 30 years. We go from the end of the 490 years that were allotted to Daniel's people to 64 AD, 30 years later, when Rome was burned and the blame was placed upon Christians, those that chose to keep the Sabbath. There have been other items that have been being presented. It's interesting to me that in 718 AD, nothing happened. In 718 BC, nothing happened. But 718 BC is within a very intriguing time period because in 742 BC, we have the proclamation of Isaiah 7. In 723, the northern tribes are taken into captivity by Assyria. In 677, taken into captivity by Babylon. These are things that are still being examined, still being looked at. But when I'm seeing all of these examples, all of these symbols, July 18th, 2020, a day where nothing happened becomes even more important, line, for our faith and for our walk. Now, any questions? We've done this overview fairly quickly. No, it's, it's clear. Clear to me right now. Okay. What other points could we address today? We have minutes, we have time remaining. One of the points that we're going to be getting into over the next several weeks, we're going to, we're going to take some time off this next week. We have a, a presentation for Sunday morning. We have some time to take off for some personal study, for personal reflection. And we're going to be preparing for some further studies. Now, as Mrs. White had indicated we will be studying further into minor prophets we're going to be looking further in zephaniah we're going to be looking in zechariah we're going to be comparing these with the book of daniel all of this is going to be important for us to do because as we compare this with the book of daniel we may well see Daniel in a light that we have never seen it before. We may find things within the book of Daniel 
that only now will begin to make sense. You say is Zephaniah and Zechariah? Yes. Okay. Now, hang with me for a moment. I'm looking to see if I've got Zephaniah. Yes, I do. I'm going to go back to a, a portion of testimonies which we have not read. And then we're going, you know, as, as we return, when we return to this next Sabbath, we're going to return into Zephaniah 1 and work to complete our study of that book. Okay, so. Okay, testimony 27. Now, if I, if I understand this right, we should be able to find this in the third, the omnibus edition of third testimonies, but I'll send this up so it can be sent out to everyone else. The Lord gave Jeremiah a message of reproof to hear, to bear to his people, charging them with the continual rejection of God's counsel, saying, I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doing, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you and to your fathers. God pled with them not to provoke him to anger with the work of their hands and hearts, but they hearkened not. Jeremiah then predicted the captivity of the Jews as their punishment for not heeding the word of the Lord. The Chaldeans were to be used as an instrument by which God would chastise his disobedient people. Their punishment was to be in proportion to their intelligence and the warnings they had despised. God had long delayed his judgments because of his unwillingness to humiliate his chosen people, but now he would visit his displeasures upon them as a last effort to check them in their evil course. This paragraph speaks yes. multitudes to our time today. Agree. In these days, he has instituted no new plan to preserve the purity of his people. He entreats the erring ones who profess his name to repent and turn from their evil ways. In the same manner that he did of old, he predicts the dangers before them by the mouth of his chosen servants. Now, as then, he sounds his note of warning and reproves sin just as faithfully as in the days of Jeremiah. But the Israel of our time have the same temptations to scorn reproof and hate counsel as did ancient Israel. They too often turn a deaf ear to the words of God that he has given his servants for the benefit of who profess the truth. Though the Lord in mercy withholds for a time the retribution of their sin, as in the days of Jeremiah, he will not always stay his hand, but will visit iniquity with righteous judgment. The Lord commanded Jeremiah to stand in the court of the Lord's house to speak unto all the people of Judah who came there to worship those things 
which he would give them to speak, diminishing not a word, that they might hearken and turn away from their evil ways. Then God would repent of the punishment which he had proposed to do unto them because of their wickedness. The unwillingness of the Lord to chastise his erring people is here vividly shown. He stays his judgments. He pleads with them to return to their allegiance. He pleads with them to return to their covenant. All and in an earlier place, he tells them to, to have courage through Moses and to Joshua. He tells them to have courage. It's, it's something that you need to really be strong about. Well, if we compare this with Ezekiel 9, is this not the same type of a message that's being given? Oh, yes, absolutely. So we're dealing with situations. We know that there will be a message that will be given to God's people. And very likely, this will be a message that will be rejected. It will be a message that will be scorned. It will be to a people that choose not to follow God. Expect it. Expect it to happen. And, 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 but if you don't deliver it, guess what? Exactly. We are, I recall this same um, turmoil uh, prior to July 18th. Okay. I do as well. I was on the phone because I supported this. There were people who were asking questions. It was a situation where did we believe it or did we not? There were those that chose Yes, I want to be part of it, but I don't know if I truly, completely believe this. Yeah, it, it was all there. I mean, uh, it, it, for myself, it took um, courage to, to continue on. I would agree. Especially when, you know, everybody's gone. <laughs> He brought them out of bondage that they might faithfully serve him, the only true and living God. But they had wandered into idolatry. They had slighted the warnings given them by the prophets, yet he defers his chastisement to give them one more opportunity to repent and avert the retribution for their sin. Through his chosen prophet, he now sends them a clear and positive warning and lays before them the only course which they can escape the punishment which they deserve. This is a full repentance of their sin and a turning from the evil of their ways. The Lord commanded Jeremiah to say to the people, thus saith the Lord, if ye will not hearken to me, to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I send unto you, both rising up early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations on the earth. They understood this reference to Shiloh. And the time when the Philistines overcame Israel and the ark of God was taken. Does 1957 with questions on doctrine represent for our time? the time when the ark of God was taken. The glory has departed, Ichabod. Exactly. 
By 1957, the church had made the decision to set aside the prophetic understanding and to accept the commendation of the world. House is left unto you desolate. Exactly. Yeah, no, it happens progressively, of course, right? So we know that we have 1888, 1919, 1957, and, and 1989. Well, 1980 and then 2001. 1989, yeah, and 2001, yeah. The sin of Eli was in passing lightly over the iniquity of his sons, who were occupying sacred offices. The neglect of the father to reprove and restrain his sons brought upon Israel a fearful calamity. The sons of Eli were slain. Eli himself lost his life. The ark of God was taken from Israel, and 30,000 of their people were slain. All this was because sin was lightly regarded and allowed to remain in their midst. What a lesson is this to men holding responsible positions in the church of God? It adjures them to faithfully remove the wrongs that dishonor the cause of truth. How many how, how, of the tribes that we've looked at so far, how many times in the book of Joshua does it say that the children of X tribe did not fully drive out the Canaanites? that they allowed them to continue to live with and within their territory. Um, I, I can count at least three times, I think. Exactly. So all of this was because sin was lightly regarded. And is not it sin to disregard the word of God? Uh, yes, absolutely. Israel thought in the days of Samuel that the presence of the ark containing the commandments of God would gain them victory over the Philistines, whether or not they repented of their wicked works. Just so the Jews in Jeremiah's time believed that the divinely appointed services of the temple being strictly observed would preserve them from the just punishment of their evil course. The same danger exists today among that people who profess to be the repository of God's law. Do we not see that the attitude regarding the Sabbath, that as long as we keep the Sabbath, as long as we're not working on the Sabbath, that we are going to be blessed, that that's just enough for our salvation. No, that, that's, that's not what the word says. No, no. Sabbath, Sabbath is just part of the picture. Agreed. Amen and amen. They are too apt to flatter themselves that the regard in which they hold the commandments should preserve them from the power of divine justice. They refuse to be reproved of evil and blame God's servants with being too zealous in putting sin out of the camp. A sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his words will bring as serious consequences upon God's people today as did the same sin upon ancient Israel. There is a limit beyond which he will no longer delay his judgments. The correction of God through his chosen instruments cannot be disregarded with impunity. The desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning before the eyes of modern Israel. <clears throat> 
when we're speaking of the desolation of Jerusalem, what and how are we referring to it? I'm sorry, I missed the last few words. <clears throat> the desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning before the eyes of modern Israel. How are we seeing the desolation of Jerusalem today? To what are we referring? When you say you're talking about the movement, how they see it. Yes? Say no? yeah. Yes. How does the movement see this desolation of Jerusalem? The falling... Uh... The looks of the falling of the uh, SDA, failings and falling of the SDA. Now, have we not seen this also happen within the movement? Yes, we have. So what are we supposed to do? Um, Circumcise the heart. Okay. Would we also not say that we are to repent? Okay, so well, repentance, yes. is a, repentance is a daily thing. So. Yes. We cannot afford to try to go forward unless we recognize our own weakness and our need for the dependence upon God's word. Yeah, and personally, as of late, um, it's become more and more apparent to me, uh, for myself. Well, as it has for me as well. The unfaltering servants of God have usually suffered the bitterest persecution from false teachers of religion. Consider that for a minute. But the true prophets will ever prefer reproach and even death rather than unfaithfulness to God. The infinite eye is upon the instruments of divine reproof, and they bear a hearty, a heavy responsibility. But God regards the injury done to them through misrepresentation or abuse the same as though it were done unto himself and will punish accordingly. No, he's, he's, he's all of those, him. all of those that blasted elder Jeff and that chose to walk contrary to these messages. Is this not the same as if we are blaming God? And how will God take that? Considering all the evidence that's been presented and rejecting it? Yep. I see it as not a very pretty picture. Uh, yeah, actually quite ugly. The princes of Judah had heard concerning the words of Jeremiah and came up from the king's house and sat in the entry of the Lord's house. Here again, we have an example that we could apply with, with Ezekiel 9. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard in your ears. But Jeremiah stood boldly before the princes and the people, declaring, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city, all the words which ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the, word, the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. 
As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good, and meet unto you. But know ye for certain, that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves, and upon this city, and upon the inhabitants thereof. For a truth the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Elder Jeff has been no different than William Miller. William Miller was no different than Elijah. Elijah was no different than John the Baptist. I have many friends that would get very upset with me over this comparison. Yet, the word that is given comes from a God that understands the end from the beginning. And he is trying to assemble his people, the people with the heart to give the final message so that this reign of sin on this earth can be ended. This is not a situation where maybe in a thousand years Christ is going to return. As I have heard leaders within the church state. This is not a situation of maybe he will, maybe he won't. We are given a message for a reason. We either take the message to heart, we either accept the message, learn the message, and present the message, or someone else will. Where do we stand today? Do we stand under Christ's banner? Or do we, un do we stand under the adversaries? Do we stand like the princes of Judah, the leaders of the church, rejecting the words of Jeremiah and seeking to put him to death? There are those that don't like what's being said right now. They view this too bluntly. They're too afraid that YouTube is going to censor. They're too afraid that when you say things bluntly and directly, oh, well, that's, that's hate speech. All we are to do is to give the word of the Lord as it is written to a land and a world that is soon to find that the judgment of God is upon them. This is our challenge today. This is the choice that we need to make. Are we willing through thought and action to give the message of God, or are we wanting through thought and action to seek the favor of the world? That is your choice. The world will let you down every time. Amen. But this is your choice today for your consideration over this coming week. Shall we pray? Father, there is much yet that we need to understand. We cannot 
as did Solomon. Walk against you. If we look to be in your kingdom. We need your guidance. We lay all before you. Direct us, please, on this Sabbath. Be with us in all that we study and in all that we do. Help us so that we may come into a clearer understanding of the work that you would set before us. For this, Father, we thank you. In this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.